So uh, uh, welcome everyone. Um, this week we have uh, Stefan Wagner from Uppsala University and he'll be talking about subtrees of graphs. And so please uh, take us away. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be giving a talk in your seminar. Um, it's my third time, I think. I, I was actually physically in South Carolina twice before um, giving talks then. Um, this is my first time in the seminar over Zoom, so let's see how it goes. Um, thank you for inviting me anyway. Um, I hope you all uh, find some interesting bits in my talk, which, as you said, is about subtrees of graphs. Uh, so I'll be talking about distributional properties, um, mainly um, some probabilistic questions around uh, subtrees in graphs. So what do I mean by subtree? Uh, let's start with subtree of trees. That's actually how historically the whole story uh, started. Uh, subtree of the trees, simply any non-empty subgraph that's again a tree. So um, like the bit that's indicated in red here, uh, the uh, six vertices that form this part, it's a subtree of the uh, bigger tree. And um, any non-empty subgraph, including single vertices, are counted as uh, subtrees. Um, and well, one thing combinatorialists like to do is to count uh, things, including subtrees. Um, and once you count things, it's also not entirely unnatural to associate a polynomial uh, with your objects, uh, similar to say the independence polynomial, the matching polynomial, and many other graph polynomials that are around. So one associates a subtree polynomial uh, with a tree where the coefficient of x to the k is simply the number of subtrees um, that have k vertices in the tree t. So to give you an example here is a simple tree with five vertices. So what's the associated subtree polynomial here? It's got five uh, subtrees of order one, that's the five single vertices, of course, and there are four uh, subtrees of order two, uh, one associated with each edge. Uh, four subtrees also of order three, uh, so it's this one, that one, uh, and two here along the four vertex path. So another four. Uh, three of all the four, you get each of them by removing one of the leaves. So there is one, uh, there is one, and the long path is also one. So, and the final one is, of course, the whole tree itself. So, um, the leading coefficient of the polynomial, the coefficient of the highest power, um, is always one. Right. Now, what can we say about the distribution of the uh, coefficients in, in this polynomial? What do we expect there to appear? Now, to get some uh, kind of idea, it might be interesting to look at a large random tree uh, like this one. This has 100 vertices and uh, see what the associated polynomial looks like, and, um, what seems to be the pattern with the coefficients. Now, when you do that, um, it looks like this. And um, I mean, this looks very suspiciously like a uh, normal distribution. It would certainly not be unreasonable uh, to conjecture that if you have a large tree, then most of the time you might be um, close to a normal distribution somehow. We will make this uh, a little bit more rigorous later on. Right. Um, so this was a large random tree, but what about uh, some very special types of trees. So, uh, I mean, the simplest types that come to mind would certainly be the long path and the star. And for these, the coefficients and therefore also the distribution um, are fairly easy to determine. So, if you take a star and then vertices, then uh, the number of uh, subtrees of order k, it's n minus 1 choose k minus 1, provided that k is at least 1 because all these subtrees are simply obtained by taking the center of the star and then any um, subset of the leaves. Uh, the only exception is the initial coefficient is one, which is n, 
um, because it also includes the, the single vertex subtrees uh, where you take one of the leaves. But uh, I mean, the large end limit, this single coefficient doesn't really matter so much. And uh, we know, of course, that the binomial coefficients um, will converge to a nice Gaussian curve in the limit. So we have a normal distribution in the spatial case of the star. However, if you look at the path, um, the situation is actually quite different. Um, because every subtree of a path is again a path, and it's uniquely characterized by the two endpoints. When you, once you fix these two, you know the entire thing. And um, the longer the subtrees become, the, the fewer possibilities you've got for the endpoints. So it's uh, then more difficult to convince yourself that the coefficients are simply uh, sk equals n plus 1 uh, minus k. So the coefficients are n, n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus 3, and so forth. So um, if you were to think of this in terms of uh, probability distributions, then in the limit, uh, you would not get anything that's normal, but rather triangular uh, distribution. So there is at least um, one example of a sequence of trees where you're not getting that normal distribution. And if you play around with um, uh, just paths and stars actually, then uh, you can generate a whole lot of uh, interesting distributions just by sort of mixing and matching. Um, one such way is to take a broom where you take a long path, length k, and then at one end you attach L leaves. And here it depends very much on how k and L relate to each other as they grow big, uh, what happens to the distribution of the coefficients. So when L is fairly large, so if you have fairly many leaves, specifically if k squared divided by L still goes to zero, then the leaves will dominate everything. So um, the long path uh, doesn't play much of a role anymore and the behavior of the coefficients is like the behavior for the star basically. So if you suitably normalize, you do the usual things, subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation, you would actually converge to a normal distribution. Then there's sort of the critical phase where uh, the path and the star are in a way equally powerful in which case the limit distribution you will get is a convolution of a uniform distribution and a Gaussian distribution. And where does that come from? Um, so mo almost all the trees, subtrees, will contain uh, the center here. And then um, they are composed of some subset of leaves and some subpath here that can have any length from one up to k. So, um, this bit, the path then basically contributes a uniform distribution because one, two, three up to k are all equally likely. Whereas here you have uh, another binomial distribution as before. So in, uh, it's exactly in the case where k squared and L are of the same order of magnitude, they're sort of equally powerful uh, in the sense that they have the same variance order of magnitude wise. So you get the convolution of uh, uniform and a Gaussian. Um, and finally, if uh, k is even larger, so if the path gets very long, then it starts to dominate um, and you, you just have convergence to uniform distribution, where basically uh, the choice comes from uh, the length of the subpath here, and that dominates the distribution. So you can get all sorts of things. And uh, if you play around even more, you can even get weird situations where uh, the distribution of the coefficients so taken to the limit becomes discontinuous. Uh, so if you carefully balance uh, two stars attached to a long path, like I did here, uh, specifically, you make the path length two to the end, and then uh, three n leaves on one end, n leaves on the other, then it turns out that this is uh, just, uh, just right to obtain a, a distribution which has a, a continuous part um, and a point measure. And uh, it's a mixture of the two. Um, so um, that comes from uh, there being two types of, of trees, essentially one containing uh, the second center and, and one not containing it, um, that are uh, in order of magnitude, sort of uh, equinumerous. So about equally many subtrees of the one type is of the other. And, and one type uh, 
produces a point measure and the other produces uh, a uniform part. So um, to summarize, in the random case, we, we seem to be getting something that's normally distributed. But if you take very specific uh, sequences of trees, then uh, the distribution of the coefficients is not necessarily always close to normal. So you can get uh, funny things as limiting distributions. All right, but what is typical? So what do you know, what do you expect uh, for most cases? And, and that's what um, I tried to answer a few years ago um, with Nino Valenzona. Um, so specifically, we're looking at uh, conditions for a no normal distribution to occur. It turns out that uh, the conditions you, you need are the following. So you want many leaves, that's one thing. You should have at least linearly many leaves, um, some fixed constant C times uh, the order. Um, and then uh, somewhat um, yeah, more unusual condition on non-branching paths. So non-branching path is simply a path in your tree where each of the internal vertices has degree two. So it doesn't branch out in any way. And um, you don't want these to get too long, basically. You don't want, don't want any long paths in your tree that do not branch out at all. Uh, specifically, the condition is that uh, these should not go longer than a little bit below the square root of the size. And then if these two are satisfied, then it turns out that the distribution of the subtree sizes does in fact always uh, converge to a Gaussian distribution, a normal distribution. So suitably normalized here means that uh, as you do in, in probability theory with your central limit theorem, uh, you subtract the mean and then you divide by the standard deviation. So as to get a normalized random variable that has mean zero and, and variance one. And uh, the, the sequence of distributions you get in that way will converge to a Gaussian. Right, so uh, both of these in a way uh, try to avoid that the, the tree gets too path-like. So path has of course, uh, smallest possible number of leaves you can think of, and it has also the longest known branching path. So, so both of these are somehow about not being too tree-like, uh, sorry, too path-like. Um, it's important here to, uh, to notice that the sequence of trees that I'm considering here can, can be a deterministic sequence of trees, uh, even though I'm, uh, I'm stating something about probability distributions. So we can, with each of the trees, I'm uh, associating a probability distribution. But the trees themselves might form a deterministic sequence, like the sequence of stars, for instance. Um, right, so sequence can in principle be taken as deterministic here. It's not necessarily a sequence of random trees here. Um, the conditions might look odd, but they're, as it turns out, essentially best possible. So we can't drop them. We can't drop the first one. We can't drop the second one. In each case, there are counterexamples um, of sequences of trees where you don't get normal distributions. Um, it's not even possible to remove the epsilon, so even that bit is sharp. So if you have fewer than linearly many, uh, that's not fewer than linearly many leaves, it's not good enough. If you have um, uh, non-branching paths of length about square root the size of the tree, that's also not good enough. Um, so you can't even remove the epsilon. It might be possible, uh, admittedly, to remove the epsilon and replace it by some log factors. So we didn't try to optimize it completely there. So, so there might be some um, room for improvement, but you can't do without the epsilon. Um, the conditions are actually not so bad. So if you take a random tree, then um, the probability that it satisfies them will actually uh, tend to zero quite rapidly as the size goes to infinity. So if you fix a C, uh, you have to fix a sufficiently small C, of course, um, 
because if you were to say to take c greater than one, you cannot possibly have more than c times the, the size of the tree in many leaves. But if you take a small value of c and a small value of epsilon, then uh, once you have fixed uh, them, uh, the probability that a random tree will satisfy both conditions for uh, 10 to one as uh, the size goes to infinity. So conditions are not too restricted. Uh, in particular, uh, the conditions do hold if there are no vertices of degree two. So uh, trees without vertices of degree two have different names. They're sometimes called homeomorphically reducible or series reduced. So there are different names for that. Um, basically, that's uh, trees that branch out at every vertex. And uh, for such trees, there is actually a conjecture due to Jemison, who um, started the investigation of uh, subtrees of trees back in the 80s, uh, that the coefficients of the subtree polynomial will always be unimodal, except at the very beginning. Unimodal, unimodal means that they increase first and then they decrease uh, from some point onwards um, without having several peaks. The exception being at the beginning, because the first coefficient is always the number of vertices, the next one is always the number of edges. So that's always one less. And then from that point on, it goes up. Um, but otherwise, uh, the coefficients are conjectured to be unimodal uh, for trees without vertices of degree two. Um, we cannot confirm the conjecture, of course, with our results, um, because sort of asymptotically being normally distributed doesn't mean that uh, the coefficients are necessarily unimodal because it's an asymptotic statement. Um, but there is some evidence uh, in, in favor of this conjecture at the very least. Right, now we move a step uh, further and uh, look at arbitrary graphs now. So what can we say about arbitrary graphs that are no longer trees? We can still define subtrees and we can still define a subtree polynomial. So all these things make sense. Um, for example, the tree, the, the graph G that I have here has, of course, four one vertex subtrees, five two vertex subtrees associated with the edges, um, eight three vertex subtrees, um, that's a little bit uh, yeah, harder maybe to count, but if you do it carefully, you will find eight. And there are also eight four vertex subtrees. That's the, exactly the spanning trees of this graph. So the subtree polynomial associated with this graph would simply be four x plus five x squared plus eight x cubed plus eight x to the four. So all the definitions uh, still make perfect sense. Um, but so the study of this subtree polynomial is, uh, is fairly recent compared to subtree polynomial for trees. So um, while the subtree polynomial of a tree was introduced uh, way back in the 80s, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the first occurrence of the subtree polynomial for, for graphs in the literature is only a few years ago. But let's um, look at uh, the, the, the leading coefficient again. Uh, so unlike uh, the situation for trees, uh, these polynomials no longer have leading coefficient one. Of course. So uh, there might be more than one spanning tree. In this case, there are eight. And if we pick one of the subtrees at random, in total, there are 25 here, then it has a probability of eight over 25 to be spanning because eight of the 25 are spanning trees. So we denote this probability by P of G. So it's eight over 25 in this case. The probability that um, a, uh, a randomly chosen subtree is spanning. Now, um, for trees, this wasn't such an interesting uh, value because well, there was only one spanning subtree in each case. And so this was simply one divided by the number of subtrees, um, which uh, becomes very, very small. So you have a, a low probability that a randomly chosen subtree would be spanning. But as this example suggested, it could be that um, there is an actual decent probability um, for a randomly chosen subtree to be spanning. 
Um, to get an idea how large that probability might be, um, we can look at the densest graph possible, the complete graph Kn, uh, because there counting subtrees is actually not so difficult. We, we know that Kn has entity and minus two spanning trees. And uh, more generally for uh, any fixed K, the number of subtrees with K vertices is simply this product because I have n choose K ways to uh, choose the vertices and then K to the K minus two ways to, to pick the edges to form this uh, subtree on these vertices. So I can now work out the probability for a random subtree of Kn to be spanning. It's this quotient. So number of spanning trees divided by total number of subtrees um, slight change of variable in the sum turns it into this. And now um, I look at the quotient of the Lth term here and the numerator, uh, some basic calculus uh, reveals that this limit is actually one over e to the L times L factorial. And as a consequence of that, uh, you find that the probability that a randomly chosen subtree of the complete graph is spanning uh, tends to one over this series, which is e to the one minus one over e. Uh, so for large n, you have uh, a probability that goes to a constant. So it's fairly large, perhaps surprisingly large. In fact, we know even a little bit more because what we worked out here, this one over e to the l over l factorial, uh, this is the ratio of uh, subtrees uh, that miss out somehow on, on L of the vertices uh, compared to the number of spanning trees. And what um, this tells us is that the probability that a random subtree has N minus L vertices also converges. It converges to e to the minus one over e, the number we've seen before, divided by e to the l l factorial. So this is a Poisson distribution. If we take a random uh, subtree, then the number of vertices it's missing, uh, that will converge to a Poisson distribution. So the subtree sizes are asymptotically Poisson distributed. To be more precisely, n minus the subtree sizes are distributed like that. And one might wonder if this is not typical. So what we've seen before for the star, that we get the normal distribution, seem to be typical there. So um, we might now be tempted to uh, conjecture that this kind of behavior is typical for dense tree graphs rather than instead of trees. All right, so you have this dichotomy there, the dense graphs and the sparse graphs. Uh, the, the densest is, of course, the complete graph. And there we have seen that many of the subtrees are spanning or at least close to spanning. Most of them are close to spanning. On the other hand, in the large tree, so the sparsest kind of connected graphs where, it, uh, where this whole business makes sense, uh, almost all the subtrees are not spanning or not even close to spanning. So one could come up with a conjecture like this. Uh, if you have a sequence of graphs, then uh, the probability that a, a randomly chosen subtree is spanning will go to zero if and only if the density or the edge density goes to zero. So it's number of edges divided by number of pairs of vertices, so a quantity between zero and one. Maybe you have a, a dense a graph, you might expect that the probability for a random subtree to be spanning uh, goes to one or uh, no, not this rate one, but uh, to some, some positive constant perhaps. If you have a very sparse graph, then you expect this probability to be small and to go to zero, or sparse sequence of graphs. Um, as you can see from this question mark here next to the word conjecture, um, this is not actually anything that anyone ever conjectured. So, um, one finds very quickly that this fails. And uh, in, the, in the first paper that uh, studied this quantity uh, at all, um, due to these four authors, Chin, Gordon, McPhee, and Vincent, uh, 2018, uh, 
So they already observed that uh, the relation isn't quite that simple. If you, for example, take a complete graph and just attach uh, a relatively small path somewhere of length, say, root n. So this is negligible in the large scheme of things. So the small part of the, um, of the vertices belong to this path, of course. So the density is still very, very high. However, uh, the probability that uh, a random subtree is spanning will actually go to zero because any subtree that is spanning will have to contain that entire path, um, which, however, is rather unlikely because there, uh, for each subtree that contains the entire path, there is also a subtree that contains the entire path minus one vertex, also one that contains the entire path minus two vertices, and so on. So there. Uh, about root n subtrees associated with each spanning tree that are not spanning. So you have that probability go to zero, even though the density uh, is not only bounded away from zero, but even goes to one. So it's, you, you come up with counterexamples like this one fairly quickly. And the problem um, you realize is certainly that uh, Globally, the trees, the, the graph is dense, but there is there is a small bit that is uh, just very sparse, and you might want to avoid that. So, um, what they did uh, to uh, rectify this is they made the additional assumption that your graph uh, should be H transitive. So you want the dense graph order of magnitude n squared many edges. And you also want each of the graphs to be edge transitive, so as to avoid the situation where some parts are sparse and some are dense. And then uh, they conjecture that the, the limiting theory of the probability is, um, is positive. So uh, you have a reasonably large probability to have a spanning tree when taking a subtree at random. And then the counterpart to that would be a conjecture on. Um, sparse graphs, so what they conjectured here was that if you have uh, into some uh, smaller power many edges, you, the probability for um, a random subtree to be spanning uh, should go to zero. We conjecture these two things, which um, are, um, well, in a, in a way, the natural things perhaps to conjecture uh, once you've started, once you've uh, studied a few examples. Indeed, the first conjecture is true. So um, one can in fact prove something a little bit stronger, um, however, in the, in, the in the same spirit, the flavor is very much the same. Um, instead of assuming edge transitivity, which is fairly strong, um, and make the condition that the minimum degree is, is large. So I don't want any parts where um, my graph is, is, is sparse. Every, uh, every vertex should have uh, a reasonably large degree. And this implies the conjecture on edge transitive graphs because edge transitive graphs are, are rather special. They are either regular or bipartite biregular. So uh, they would satisfy this if they are dense. Now, if we're assuming a minimum degree condition like this, then it turns out that we can explicitly bound the uh, probability P of G. So it's, it's greater than or equal to e to the minus one of alpha, where alpha is the constant here, um, and some error term. So for large n, the bound will is basically be e to the minus one over alpha. So how does one prove this? Um, how do we? get such a lower bound. The key idea is a double counting argument, where um, you start with a graph minimum degree bounded below by alpha times n, um, and you count the number of pairs consisting of a spanning tree like this here, and some subtree of that spanning tree um, that is missing k vertices. Right, so um, one possible pair in this tree consists of that red spanning tree and 
the blue subtree of that spanning tree. And this would be one of the pairs in this example counted by P1 because uh, the subtree S is missing exactly one of the vertices. Now we count this number in two different ways. We can start counting with S, so we can start counting with T. And if we start with T, with the spanning tree, then, well, we have Sn of G, number of uh, spanning trees of G, many choices. And for each of them, we have certainly at most N choose K choices for S, because that's the number of ways to choose any K vertices to remove. Some of these choices might not give me a subtree, because if I remove something in the middle, the tree might fall apart. Uh, but certainly this is an upper bound. There are no more than N choose K many choices uh, for the spanning tree, uh, for the subtree S, once I have chosen T. So I can bound this number of pairs by N choose K times the number of spanning trees, um, and then that by N to the K over K factorial S and G using the usual upper bound for binomial coefficients. And then we get a corresponding lower bound by starting with S. So this is a little bit trickier, but not all that much. Um, for each of the K vertices that are not in S, um, you, you notice that um, there are at least delta minus K neighbors in S, right? Because K is the number of um, vertices that are missing in S. Um, and there are at least delta neighbors, delta being the minimum degree. So at least delta minus K of the neighbors um, are in fact in S. So what I can do now, given S is to, sorry, extend it to a spanning tree by just attaching uh, each of the K missing vertices one of the vertices of S. Um, and I can do this in at least delta minus K many ways because there are at least that many edges going directly to S. So I have at least delta minus K to the power K many ways to extend S, S to a spanning tree. And so I have a simple lower bound as well for every K um, up to delta. So I have a nice chain of inequalities uh, using also that delta is bounded from above, delta is greater than or equal to alpha N. Uh, alpha a minus k to the k less than or equal to n to the k over k factorial s n. So for small k, uh, the minus k here doesn't actually matter so much. So I get that s n minus k, uh, the number of subtrees with n minus k vertices is at most uh, this factor times the number of spanning trees plus some irritant. And uh, it turns out the error term doesn't matter so much. Large values of k are also negligible. So if I sum this over all k, then I get the total number of subtrees on the left and the sum of these guys over all k times s n of d. The sum is here is simply e to the one of alpha plus an error term, which I'm not going to talk much about. Um, but that's pre precisely the desired inequality. I have the total number of subtrees here, and I have bounded it from above by some constant times the number of spanning trees. So this is the, the key idea of the proof, this double counting argument where I count pairs of spanning tree and the subtree contained within it in two different ways. And what about sparse graphs? This was now for dense graphs where the minimum degree was bounded below. Uh, for sparse graphs, it turns out that even the revised conjecture is not quite correct. Um, you can still construct sequences of uh, sparse graphs for which uh, this probability uh, has a positive limit. Uh, one way to do that is to take a long path and then two complete graphs at the ends. The complete graphs don't need to be huge. You can take into some small power there. Uh, then it turns out that actually the graph is very, very sparse. It has only linearly many edges. Um, however, if you do the calculations, you find that most of the subtrees will have to contain the entire long path and vertices on both ends. So then, uh, at least heuristically, probability that a, a subtree is spanning is probability that a subtree is spanning in the one complete graph times the probability of spanning in the other complete graph, uh, which explains this e to the minus 2v. It's just the, the probability for a complete graph squared. 
So if you take um, so highly structured graphs where some parts are very dense and some parts are very sparse, you can still construct nasty counter examples. So what's the next best thing if you can't even fix uh, the, the conjecture uh, like this? So, well, you, you might want to try uh, random graphs instead, because random graphs will never look like this. They're uh, so very uniform. All the parts look more or less the same. It turns out then that in, in this case, both the conjectures do hold true uh, in probability. If you consider the classical edge any random graph, uh, GNP, where uh, the probability P that an edge is included uh, is allowed to depend on the number of vertices. Um, if you consider such random graphs, then it turns out that as n goes to infinity, if P goes to a positive limit, you have convergence of P to a positive limit as well. Uh, and one can even calculate the limit. It is a deterministic limit, no longer random. So you have convergence in probability to a constant. Um, whereas if um, we have sparse graphs, so if P goes to zero within, then uh, the probability P of G goes to zero. Um, maybe not surprising also looking at the first part, if here you let P infinity go to zero, then that uh, expression will go to zero as well. All right, so what goes into this proof? Main ingredients are similar. It's the same double counting idea as before, mixed with some typical random graph arguments. So we know that random graphs are almost regu regular in some sense. Most of the vertex degrees are very close to Pn. Um, then we know quite a bit about trees. Uh, most trees have about n over e leaves, which is useful uh, because the number of subtrees that a spanning tree has can be bounded in terms of the number of leaves, uh, namely like this. So the one uh, inequality is, is easy. The, the lower one here, uh, you can take any subset of leaves and remove them and you get a subtree. Uh, the upper bound is slightly more complicated, but uh, also not too difficult to prove. And you see here that if, if k is comparatively small compared to L, then they're sort of the same as in Totti. They're both about L to the k over k factorial. So uh, you can estimate the number of subtrees of the spanning tree quite well in terms of the number of leaves. And then if in addition to that, you also know that most of the trees will have about this many leaves, uh, yeah, you can combine it quite nicely uh, in the double counting argument. Um, a couple of corollaries follow from this. So now knowing something about the distribution, uh, you, you can also uh, determine a bit more. We have this Poisson behavior that we have observed for the complete graph. So for every fixed k, the number of subtrees that are missing k of the vertices divided by the number of spanning subtrees, uh, that will go to, um, well, this constant here in probability. So that's exactly the probability associated with the Poisson distribution of parameter e p infinity um, up to the scaling factor e to the minus one over e. Uh, p infinity. Um, one can determine, for instance, the average number of vertices in a random subtree. Uh, turns out to be very close to n. Uh, not surprising, based on what we know now. We know that most of the trees are spanning, or at least close to spanning. So the average number of vertices in a random subtree um, will be close to n, and the difference will converge to a constant as well. Uh, all of that also in, in probability. Um, we can use what we've shown also uh, to say something about the total number of subtrees, because we, we can now relate the total number of subtrees to the total number of spanning trees. And um, Janssen proved uh, something about the distribution of the number of spanning trees in random graphs. Uh, I don't know, about 20 years ago, I think it was. So he showed that logarithm of the number of spanning trees 
uh, is asymptotically normal. And now we know that there is not such a big difference between number of spanning trees and, and number of subtrees. Your question is about constant, so we can prove this statement as a corollary. Let me finally say something about the subtree polynomial and its roots. So, um, Brown and Mohr studied the roots of the subtree polynomial of the tree. Um, this is also quite classical. Uh, the roots of many different graph polynomials have been studied in the literature, and there a lot is known about them. Um, so for the roots of the subtree polynomial specifically, uh, they found that um, they so form a, roughly a ring, an annulus. Uh, this here, this figure shows all the possible roots of subtree polynomials of trees uh, up to order 14. And um, you see one dot here at zero, which is always there, but the rest is in this annulus shape. And in fact, they proved that all the roots of subtree polynomials are necessarily confined to some disk. So the disk is about like this. It's a little bit bigger than what we see here, but uh, it's not too much bigger. Um, and they conjectured further that uh, generally the, um, the roots will lie in, in a certain annulus. Um, that looks like it's uh, not in a circle out here and the outer circle about there, uh, both centered at, at negative a half. So they couldn't quite prove the analyst bit, but they did at least uh, obtain that there is some disk to which the, uh, the roots of the subtree polynomial are confined. This is in contrast to other uh, graph polynomials. So for example, if you take the independence polynomial of, of graphs, uh, the, the roots are all over the place. They lie dense in the plane. For matching polynomial, it's, it's again entirely different. There, the roots are all real, uh, but they can get arbitrarily large. So it's a somewhat unusual behavior, perhaps. Now, what about the subtree polynomial of dense graphs? So what we have just shown um, could in fact be used also to get something out about uh, the roots of the subtree polynomial. Um, because um, we can now asymptotically evaluate the subtree polynomial as, as n goes large for random graphs. Um, so for each fixed x, the value of the subtree polynomial at x divided by the leading term uh, will converge to some constant depending on x for every complex uh, x other than zero, um, as long as you keep it fixed. And the idea is simply to use this Poisson approximation that we have observed. So the Sn minus k coefficient can be well approximated by Sn times this Poisson term. And then you just evaluate the series. Uh, this is slightly heuristic, of course, uh, because one has to take care of error terms, but this is uh, in a nutshell what one can do. Right. So we know something about the behavior of the values of the, the subtree polynomial in large uh, random graphs that are also dense. And if uh, we look at this further, we see that, well, this here is so just a prefactor. Um, and then this here is never zero. So um, we expect, and this can be made rigorous with some uniformity arguments, that the roots of the subtree polynomial of large dense graphs will cluster around zero. So because this is basically the only bit from where we can get zeros. So if you have a large random uh, graph, GMP, then for some function a, R of n that goes to zero, uh, the maximum modulus of all the zeros is, is bounded by R of n, as we talked about this surely. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the optimal choice of R of n is. Um, I am working on, on this kind of questions uh, with a, a PhD student. So um, a goal here is also to, to de-randomize this. Um, and uh, it would seem that 
one can indeed replace the random graph bit by um, a uh, minimum degree condition as we had previously. So if we just impose something on the minimum degrees, but then one can also bound the, the roots, uh, showing that the, the roots of the subtree polynomial for dense graphs are rather different from the roots of the subtree polynomial um, of trees, or maybe more generally sparse graphs. So some uh, directions for current and future work. One might want to get analogous results for other kind of similar graph polynomials um, instead of subtrees, one can, of course, uh, consider similar quantities like the number of uh, uh, connected subgraphs. This has been uh, studied fairly recently and some other variants. What can we say about uh, other random graph models? Um, what about the asymptotic Poisson distribution, roots of the subtree polynomial? This is the thing I mentioned. Uh, can we do this for deterministic dense graphs as well? So I showed it for random graphs. Um, for deterministic dense graphs, this is still some work in progress. Um, I will uh, finish with an open question that is, is not so much related to what I showed you now. Um, so I showed you some results about this quantity P of G, the, the probability that a random subtree is spanning. Um, to the best of my knowledge, it is not even known what the maximum of that probability is, uh, given the number of vertices. Um, it seems reasonable to conjecture that the maximum is attained for uh, the complete graph. Um, but as far as I know, uh, nobody can prove that uh, at this point in time. So uh, that's my final challenge to the audience. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thanks again for having me. And uh, I'll welcome any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, let's all thank our speaker in some way. <laughs> um, and uh, are there any questions? Yes, I got a question for you. Um, this result about the uh, random graphs having uh, high probability of being spanning, I, I wonder is it? Is it enough to know that the, all the induced subgraphs have similar density, um, right? Like, is it presumably not the randomness, but somehow the, that all parts of the graph look the same or something, right? That you can get uh, it. It's, it's, it's likely that one can uh, weaken the conditions even further, yeah. So yeah. basically you need to somehow make this double counting argument work. Um, and uh, it's, it's not, so crucial that it works for absolutely every single vertex. You can probably allow yourself some leeway and say, uh, occasionally this can fail. But uh, um, yeah, I, I don't know what exactly an optimal condition would look like. Uh, probably, as you say, one can replace it by something like uh, uh, the density of every induced subgraph is bounded away by one in some way or the other. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question that can counting subtrees somehow be related to counting subforests because subforest seems to form like a matroid or a simplicial complex and I don't know, maybe there is more literature there or it's a completely unrelatable issue. I mean, it's certainly not completely unrelatable. I, I, I see no immediate way to, let's say, uh, if you can count, the no, if, you, if you know the number of subtrees of all sizes, you would you would know anything about the number of subforests of all sizes. Um, but certainly the uh, the questions are very much related, and uh, uh, in, in, instead of subforests, there is also a variant of that, um, which is a rooted subforest. So where each of the components of of the uh, of the subforests gets a root. The reason why these are interesting is that they occur um, as, uh, as coefficients in the uh, characteristic polynomial of the Laplacian. So there, there are several other counting questions that are uh, of a similar flavor, even though um, I'm not sure if one can sort of easily translate questions from one to the other always.
Okay. Uh, any other questions for our speaker? All right. If not, then uh, thanks again for a uh, for a wonderful talk. Um, thank you so much. Uh, um, yeah, I think uh, I think we'll go ahead and and, and wrap it up there. And uh, I'm I'm glad to have have uh, seen you seen you. I, I've read some of your work in my uh, <laughs> some of my some of my research. So um, uh, uh, thanks again, and uh, <laughs> have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you very much. I hope to see many of you in person again at some point. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks. Thanks again for having me and have a good weekend. Thank you.